Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in the wonderful name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. It's always good to be here with our brethren and friends in Tempe. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with prayerful, thankful hearts, as always thanking you for every good thing. For the cross, for the blood of your Son that cleanses us from all sin. For your word and for your spirit. Meet with us now, Lord God, opening our eyes to your word, <clears throat> to its glory and to its meaning. More than this, Lord God, empower us to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Turn with me, first of all, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. We're looking at the genesis of idolatry. John, chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him <clears throat> have eternal life. Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness on a pole called a ness, and whoever looks on it will have eternal life. Obviously, what Moses lifted up is a picture or a type of Christ on the cross, crucified. This serpent in Hebrew is called Nehushtan, Nehushtan, strange word, coming from the Hebrew word Nehoshet, Nehoshet meaning brass or copper or bronze. Now in biblical typology, everything depended on the tabernacle. The Holy of Holies, everything was gold. Gold was a non-corrosive metal, is a non-corrosive metal. It speaks of that which is eternal. It doesn't oxidize, it doesn't rust. It's the most valuable of all. But as you proceed out from the Holy of Holies, outward, it becomes more silver. Silver is a precious metal, but it's corrosive, it will rust. It's of temporary value. Silver is always associated with the price of salvation. The half shekel for the firstborn, Jesus was betrayed for silver. In the book of Revelation, when all things are restored, you don't see silver anymore. We'll always be eternally grateful for our salvation, but we were not created to be saved. The fall of man and our salvation was parenthetical. It was an interruption. We were created to be God's children. But as you go out further to where the outer court was and where the altar was, you have bronze. Bronze. Bronze speaks of judgment. The lavender, bronze lavender, uh, lavin, and also the bronze-plated altar. It speaks of judgment. So you begin from Brass to silver to gold. Begins with judgment. We burn the sacrifices. Then silver, the salvation. And then ultimately you come to the Lord, entering into the Holy of Holies, where everything was gold, as in the temple veil being torn. This serpent had to be made out of nehoshet, bronze. And Jesus tells us, this serpent being held up on a pole is a picture of himself. That by looking upon it, we have eternal life. When we look upon the risen Lord, we have eternal life, and the Old Testament shadow of this is what we read in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, the Nahushtan. Turn with me, please, to the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, and let's understand what Jesus was telling us. The people began to complain and rebel against God and against Moses. They longed for the things of Egypt. They complained about the trials they were having, the times of testing. And in verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we've spoken against the Lord and you. Notice when people turn against the Lord, they also turn against the leader. Then it continues. We've sinned because we've spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Moses, again, a type of Christ. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man... When he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, first of all, we know that serpents are pictures of Satan in the Bible, going all the way back to the book of Genesis. Why is something that's a picture of sin, the demonic, 
judgment for sin. Also a picture of Christ. Obviously, he who knew no sin became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. When he went to the cross, when he was lifted up on the cross, it's like the Nehushtan being lifted up on the pole. He who knew no sin became sin. But notice for it to do the people any good in verse 7, the first thing they had to do was acknowledge their sin. We have sinned because we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Unless there is a repentance, unless there is a turning from sin, the gospel will do people no good. Unless there is a repentance, an admission of guilt, the cross of Jesus will avail nothing. Now this is very important in an age where we have so-called seeker-friendly approaches to evangelism. On page 271 of Purpose Driven, it actually says, and I'm only quoting, if you see an unsaved person living immorally, if you see them into substance abuse, see them into fornication or whatever, don't tell them to repent. Tell them to get Jesus into their life. Once Jesus comes into their life, then God will clean them up. We have to love them. We have to love them into the kingdom. Nothing could be more unbiblical. What he's doing is confusing justification with sanctification. Unless someone repents and acknowledges their sin, Jesus isn't coming into their life. Unless people have a confrontation of their own guilt and their own sin, unless there's a conviction of sin, Jesus will not come into their life. The cross will do them absolutely no good. This in part goes back to the late John Wimber. He said, we're going to take the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and put it into the language of the family drawing room. Instead of God as judge, he's going to be loving father. The two are not mutually exclusive. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put the gospel into the language of a courtroom. Jesus was put on trial for our sin in our place. Unless we understand God is an angry judge who will judge sin, we will never know him as loving father. These trends today are totally unbiblical and are totally dangerous. They're a false gospel. They're a formula for false conversion. The Nehushtan will do the people no good until they acknowledge their sin. The cross of Jesus, of which the Nehushtan is a picture, will do people no good unless there's a repentance. Repent and be baptized, Acts 2.38. The apostles never compromised repentance. Either did John Wesley, either did George Whitfield, either did Charles Spurgeon, either did D.L. Moody, either did anybody who God ever used to bring revival. They always preached repentance. But let's continue. It had to be lifted up. And although the serpents continued to bite the people, they would live. The serpent's bite is deadly. The wages of sin is death. It is only by looking at the crucified Lord that the bite of the serpent has no power over us. The ramifications of sin cannot kill us if we look upon the one who was crucified in our place. He who was lifted up. If we look upon him, although there's ramifications of sin, they can't kill us. I have a problem with my nasal septum. It goes back to the cocaine addiction of my youth. The Lord has given me a new heart. I hope he's in the process of giving me a new brain, but he's not yet given me a new nose. <laughs> There's a repercussion of what I did in my old nature. Now, he can heal it. Maybe he will. But he will certainly heal it in the resurrection. Even if I died from it, I would live. The serpent will bite, but I'll still live because of the one who was crucified in my place. If I look upon the crucified Lord who is risen, indeed, although the serpent will bite, I will live. Sin will always have a ramification. There will always be repercussions. Now, the worst repercussion falls on Jesus. But it will affect us. It's just that the effect will not be unto death because of the one who was lifted up on the cross. So what we have in the Nehushtan is a picture of the cross of Jesus. So far, so good. But it begins to get complicated. Turn with me to Second Kings chapter 18. After a time of tremendous backsliding, a time of incredible revival comes under the leadership of King Hezekiah, the best king there was of Judah since King David. Now he does a lot of good things. Verse 3, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all his father David had done. David is the Old Testament shadow of Christ as king and good shepherd. 
Peter tells us, and John 10 tells us, how good of a pastor a pastor is, is how much like Jesus he is. Well, the Old Testament shadow of Jesus is David. How good of a king the kings were depended on how much like David they were. David was the Old Testament shadow of Jesus. Remember, Ezekiel 34 tells us that the kings of Israel and Judah were to be shepherds. Hebrew word, roe, same as the word for pastor. Episcopo in Greek. And so we have a situation here where this guy is a good king bringing revival. But then in verse 4, he removes the high places. He gets rid of unbiblical worship. And he breaks down the sacred pillars and cut down the asherot. He gets rid of the female cult deities, and he gets rid of the phallic symbol worship. But then it continues, He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He destroys the Nehushtan. He gets rid of something God ordained. The Nehushtan was not bad, it was good. It was something God ordained to be made for a reason. In fact, it was a picture, according to Jesus in John 3.14, of Christ on the cross. What was the Nehushtan? A crucifix. There's an image lifted up on a pole. Why did he destroy it? Why did he get rid of it? Why did he get rid of something that God ordained to be constructed, to be made? Why did he get rid of something that's a picture, a shadow of Jesus on the cross? Why did he have to get rid of it? Now understand this. Those who were in Mormonism or Roman Catholicism or the Eastern Orthodox Church to defend their veneration of icons will frequently say things like, well, God ordained the cherubs to be made for the ark, or God ordained the Nehushtan to be made. It's not wrong to have graven images. There is a difference between religious art, for instance, and an idol. What is the difference? If you would read the first of the commandments in Hebrew, the, from the Decalogue, I am the Lord your God, you will have no other gods before me, but then you shall not make a graven image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. The problem was not the image itself or what it represented, but two Hebrew words, Hishtakbaya and Avodah, bowing down to it and in some way serving it. They began to worship the image. They made it into a crucifix. They began burning incense before it. Something that God had ordained, something that God decreed should be made. Something that's a picture of something good, something biblical, had to be destroyed because it became something God never intended it to be. An object of veneration. An object of idolatry. And although those who bow down to images will tell you it's not idolatry, it is. It's the same Hebrew word, hishtak bayah. To bow down is to worship. Proskuto in Greek. We are forbidden to do it. What's the problem with the crucifix? Well, to begin with, the problem with the crucifix is the wrong person is on it. Christ is risen. Now, I think every Christian should have a crucifix. I think every Christian should maybe even wear a crucifix, providing it is them on it, not Jesus. <laughs> the problem with the crucifix is the wrong person is on it. He is risen. We are called to crucify the old nature, crucify the flesh. That is the problem. Notice something that God ordained, something that was biblical was perverted by religious blindness into something it was never intended to be. The image the, became the focus. That's always how idolatry works. It begins with the corruption of something good. It begins with the corruption of something that God ordained into something God never intended it to be. The church did not begin by praying to the dead. 
it was in the 5th century in the Council of Ephesus that they proclaimed Mary Theotokos, a word that had been found in the Bible, the mother of God. They took the attributes of Diana of Ephesus and applied them to Mary. But it didn't begin like that. It began with the crucifix. Israel did not begin with idolatry. It began with the Nehushtan, with the high places. The misuse of that which God ordained. The degeneration, the corruption of it into something he never intended. That's how idolatry works. But it's difficult to see what's wrong with the Nehushtan. It's difficult to see what's wrong with the crucifix. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Sorry, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Now here in this verse in Ephesians, and also a verse in Corinthians, covetousness is directly associated with idolatry. As a young believer, I had the idea that thou shalt not covet means if you begin to covet someone's goods, it'll cause you to want to steal them. If you covet someone's wife or someone's husband, it'll begin to tempt you to want to commit adultery with them. Well, that's true, but that's not mainly the problem. Covetousness is not mainly associated in the Bible with theft or with adultery. It's associated with idolatry. When we covet something, it becomes a god. But look how it works. The first thing we see is that no immoral person, and the connotation here is sexually immoral, or impure person. The word impure in Greek is akathosis. Catharsis is pure, like it's been cleansed, but akathosis. It is simply the Greek translation of the Hebrew word tachor. Lev tachor brali Elohim, David prayed in his Psalm of Repentance, 51. Lev tachor brali Elohim created me a, not clean heart, but pure heart. What does it mean? No mixture. No mixture. Pure means there's no mixture. If something is 96% pure chemically, there's a mixture. No mixture. How does idolatry work? There's a mixture. Something true with something false. Remember, the Hebrews could not make a garment of woolen flax because God hates the mixture. The waters of Laodicea. The Roman aqueduct brings the water down from the hot springs of Pamukkala. You've got the cold springs in Laodicea and the hot springs. But where they mix, they're lukewarm. Christ spit it out. Peter, Paris of Lucin, they put truth next to error. Be careful of those who tell you, well, there's some truth in it. There's some good in it. Yes, when the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons knock on the door, they'll be saying things that are true. They'll be saying things that you and I will agree with. There's a mixture. There is impurity. In our motives, it's the same. You can love somebody, but if you're going to love somebody and you're going to desire to sleep with them sexually, there will not be impurity. You'll do the right thing. You'll get married. Now, you can sleep with somebody outside of marriage, and you can indeed really love that person. But in fact, there's a mixture of love and lust. If it was pure love, you would reserve it for holy wedlock. There's always a mixture. But then it says, or covetous man who is an idolater. Idolatry always corrupts something good. God created them male and female. His first command, go forth and multiply. God says it's good. You've got to corrupt it. Doesn't matter if it's sex. Doesn't matter if it's the Nehushtan. Doesn't matter what it is. As long as it's something good, something true, something pure that can be corrupted, that'll do. That's how idolatry begins. But let's go further with this. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Christ died once and for all. 
It's like Moses striking the rock multiple times. When we did the Catholic conference here, we explained about the doctrine of the Mass and transubstantiation. There's no need to go through it at length again, because it's here already recorded by the Church. However, in Hebrews chapter 7, we read repeatedly that we do not need a high priest, in verse 27, to offer up daily sacrifices, because this did Christ did once and for all. Hebrews chapter 9, it is the same thing. Jesus did this once and for all, in verse 12, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews chapter 10, it's the same. Verse 14, for by one offering he is perfected for all time. Verse 12, he offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. Jesus dies once, of course the Roman church says he continues to die sacramentally. They need a crucifix. We need a risen Lord. Now we also need a crucifix, but we should be on it, not Christ. But let's go further. It's very hard to tell these people that this is wrong. What do you mean? It's in the Bible. Jesus was crucified for our sin. Yeah, but he's risen now. And although God did ordain that, you're not understanding it correctly. What do you mean I'm not understanding it correctly? It says he was crucified. Here's the crucifixion. It's hard to talk to people, isn't it? But why is it hard? Let's understand this further. How does it come about? Why is it so difficult for people to see idolatry? When I was in Toronto, Canada, for other business, everyone was going there saying, get the blessing, get the blessing, get the blessing. Now, I knew it was no blessing. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it. The Greek word is akrete. It could not possibly be the Holy Spirit. And I say that as a Pentecostal myself. Pentecostal in the biblical sense, not the popular sense. The first thing I noticed, though, I, I was, happened to be in town for other business, so I decided to go there. And what I saw in person was worse, actually, than what I saw in the videos. But the first thing I noticed, everyone was standing up and they were coming there from other countries. Nobody was talking about Jesus. Everybody was talking about, I was here last night and my hand kept shaking and I couldn't control it, it must be God. Those people were not seeking Jesus. They were not seeking God, they were seeking an experience. That's what they were worshipping in. It was not Him who was the focus. It was an experience they ascribed wrongly and unbiblically to Him. Because it happened in a church and because they were saying, Jesus, what Jesus? Because they were saying it's the Holy Spirit, well, the biblical Holy Spirit, His fruit is self-control, not the lack of it, it was a different spirit. They couldn't see it. Why could they not see it? On the David and Goliath tape, we've tried to explain how every cult and every false religion in the world, if you really listen to what they're saying, and if you really understand what they believe, they all worship the ism. Jehovah's Witnesses do not worship Jehovah. They worship the organization, the institution. They worship the Watchtower Society. That's their God. Their God is the ism. They deify the institution. If you've ever really witnessed to Mormons in Utah at any length, and you talk to them, you realize not only is their Jesus not our Jesus, their Jesus is the half-brother of Satan. And you got this guy Romney running for president, and Pat Robinson, and these guys are backing him. A man who says that Jesus is the half-brother of Satan. But you got a situation where when you talk to them, you realize that their God is the Church of Latter day Saints. Their God is the ism. They worship the ism. I'm an evangelist to Jewish people. I've witnessed the Orthodox and Ultra Orthodox Jews many, many, many times in many countries Israel, America, Australia. 
When you talk to ultra-Orthodox rabbis, when you talk to Hasidic Jews, you realize they're not worshipping the God of Israel. They worship Talmudic Judaism. Their God is Talmudic Judaism. They worship the ism. I know a number of you are former Roman Catholics who've been saved. I was just in Italy. I got back from Italy last week. I saw people going up flights of stairs with rosy beads in their hands trying to get their mother out of purgatory. The blood of Christ does not cleanse from all sin in their thinking. These poor people. Deluded by idolatry, superstition, and bondage. But when you try to talk to devout Catholics, you understand something. It's not about God. It's not even about Mary. It's about, quote-unquote, Holy Mother the Church. Devout Catholics worship Roman Catholicism. You see the fundamentalist Muslims on TV. Terrorists. Killers. Murderers. A religion based on intolerance and hatred. No matter what lies you hear from the media, that's exactly what Islam is. Nonetheless, when you understand Muslims, when you really talk to them, when you try to witness to them, you understand that they don't worship Allah. Allah is just the Arabian moon god anyway, the ancient Nabataean lunar deity. It's not even about Muhammad. They worship Islam. Every false religion in the world worships the ism. Every cult in the world worships the ism. But now we face a situation, a danger in the last days that Jesus himself warned of. In Matthew 24, he said, Let he who is in the field not go back for his cloak, the mantle of authority. What happens when the work of the Lord? becomes more important than the Lord of the work. What happens when the ministry becomes deified? Just like the Nehushtan, it is biblical in its origin. Just like the Nehushtan, it is something God himself ordained. But just like the Nehushtan, something good becomes something bad. Something ordained and established of God is transformed by religiosity into something God never intended it to be. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 115. This is a very famous psalm in Hebrew liturgy. liturgy. Lo aleinu, not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us. That's the beginning in verse 1. Lo aleinu, Adonai. Lo aleinu. Lacha, l'shimcha hatefedet. To you, to your name be the glory. The deification of ourselves, of something to do with man, of something we build. In verse 4, their idols are silver and gold. The work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. I have a Catholic mother. She'll trust in a crucifix. She'll trust in a statue of a Madonna. She'll trust in a scapula. She'll trust in anything and everything but the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I have Jewish families who will similarly trust in tefillin. They'll trust in keeping kosher. They'll trust in Shabbat. They will trust in anything and everything but their own risen Messiah. But there's a problem. Can that statue, can a crucifix, see? Can a graven image, see? Can a graven image, 
hear? A graven image cannot hear. A graven image cannot see. And those who make them, in verse 8, will become like them. Idolatry will lead people into something the scriptures call a spirit of error. Where they can't see. It is impossible for a statue to see. Therefore, those who trust in their crucifix or in their statue will not be able to see. You can show them, look, this is not biblical, this is not scriptural, this is not what it's supposed to be. They can't see it. What do you mean it's in the Bible? But they can't see it. You can very patiently try to explain the scripture and tell them the truth. They can't hear. Why? You become like that which you worship. You become like your God. You become like that in which you trust. I have to be careful. There's a verse that says that God is their belly. <laughs> what is it with Jehovah's Witnesses? You can prove he's worshipped, that Jesus is worshipped as God. You can prove it. You can show them and prove to them that their leaders and founders are false prophets. That the resurrection had to be literal. They can't see what you're saying. You show them from the Bible, they can't see it. You explain the scriptures, they can't hear it. Can an institution see or hear? Can a publication like the Watchtower see or hear? Can a Wake magazine, does it have eyes or ears? No. They become as blind and as deaf as that in which they trust. Islam, the same. Mormonism, the same. Talmudic Judaism, the same. They become as blind and deaf as that in which they falsely mistake to be God. They become as blind and deaf as that in which they set their trust. But those are unsaved people. That's Mormons. That's Roman Catholics. That's Jehovah's Witness. That's Orthodox Jews. That's Muslims. What happens when the same thing takes place? in the body of Christ. What happens when the church becomes ecclesiocentric instead of Christocentric? What happens, like Isaiah 28, woe to the crown of the proud drunkards of the thrine, a church that seeks its own glory? What is kingdom now theology and post-millennialism about? The deification of the church. We're going to conquer the world before Christ comes. Then he'll come. It is not the woman who crushes the seed of the serpent, the head of the snake. It is the seed of the woman. It's Jesus. The Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. God will not give his glory to another. But you talk to these people who are caught up in Reformed Calvinism and Reconstructionism. They can't see it. They can't hear it. Their God is not the God of the Bible. Their God is the God of hyper-Calvinism. If they profess to be born again. What happens when the focus of the church becomes the building in which it meets? When the building program becomes central to everything they're focused on? Missions and evangelism get sidelined. Exposition of the word is sidelined. Don't get me wrong, if God says get a building, by all means get a building. If God says get a thousand buildings, get a thousand buildings, if God says it. But when it becomes a monument to a man's ministry, it is an idol. They worship the building, the crystal cathedral. That man would claim to be evangelical.
But once they go into idolatry, even though they may claim to be Christian, pretty soon you find out they're really not anymore if they ever were. Mr. Schuler actually said he wouldn't mind if his grandchildren became Muslim when he had the Grand Mufti of Damascus, a Muslim clergyman, preaching in his pulpit. He said Jesus Christ went to the cross to magnify his ego. Deification of the ministry. The building. The church. Watch out. When the people in the church begin to take on the personality of the leaders. When they begin to become clones of the leadership. I say this with a sense of shame. There are people in England that if I told them to stand on their head and whistle Dixie, they would do it. Even though the repeated focus of everything I've always said is, look, be a Berean. Test all things, hold fast to that which is true. There are people that if I told them to stand on their head and whistle Dixie, I believe some of them would honestly do it. Watch out. You see, it's easier to look at a Nahushtan. It's easier to look at a crucifix than it is to look to Jesus. It's easy to look to an image, to an institution, than it is to Jesus. It's easier to look at an image of Christ on the cross than to pick up your own cross and follow him. Nothing can deceive like religion. The deification of the ministry the deification of the church. They can become personality cults. Inevitably, it leads to heavy shepherding, financial exploitation. This is a nice building. Nobody told me to say this, but let me tell you why I respect your pastor. When he didn't believe God was in it anymore, he was willing to get rid of it. Not even know where he's going. But he knows the church is not the building. The church is the body of Christ. It's Jesus and it's you. The deification of the ministry. But because it's biblical, people can't see it. Because it's scriptural, people go with it. They think it's God, they think it's God, they think it's God. Well, it's a God. But it's not the God. The work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. The place the church meets becomes more important than the church. It becomes a personality cult. Look at it again in Psalm 115. Verse 4, the work of man's hands. They've mouths, but they can't speak. You see the people caught up in it. The ones who follow the TBN stuff and the money preachers on TV, they all speak in cliches, but they can't say anything sensible. Certainly nothing biblical. They have eyes, but they cannot see. Ears, but they cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. The sermon is gone, they can't even smell the rat. Have hands, but they can't feel. They can't tell you what's wrong. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They're going nowhere in terms of walking with Christ. They make a sound with their throat. Their worship has become entertainment. You realize what's happened? I've warned about this repeatedly in Nashville, Tennessee. What used to be music ministry is now a music industry. Christian record companies are owned by secular conglomerates. They've got pop stars, pop charts. It's become a business and an industry. The worship of worship. Church becomes a concert and a motivational speech. They can make a sound with their throat, but they cannot praise the true God anymore. Those who make them will become like them. Every 
everyone who trusts in them, we become like that in which we trust. You trust in a church, you'll become like it. You trust in an idol, you'll become like it. Just look at the glamour industry. They worship the image of sexuality. Whole Hollywood thing, the Seventh Avenue thing, the fact they worship that image. A God they can't keep. Nobody stays young and good looking forever, not even me. <laughs> but I've met Christians in the fashion industry and I've met Christians in the film industry. That's a religion to those people. That's a religion. They trust in a God that cannot save. They trust in a God who cannot deliver. <laughs> what happens when Christians do the same? Very briefly, turn with me, please, to the prophet Amos, chapter 5. Verse 5. Do not resort to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. Do not come to Gilgal, the rolling away, nor cross the Beersheba, the place of the wells. Gilgal will go to captivity. Bethel will come to trouble. Believe me, I pointed this out on the Abraham's Journey tape. The church will let you down. Bethel, the house of God, the church will let you down. If you trust in a church, the church is going to let you down. You trust in a denomination, it'll let you down. You trust in a movement, it'll let you down. Why will it let you down? Because it's made up of people just like you and just like me. It's only the risen Lord who does not let us down. Look at Amos chapter 4, verse 4. I love this. Enter Bethel and transgress. Come to church and sin. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering from that which is leavened. In other words, that which has sin and false doctrine. Proclaim free will offering. Make them known. So you love to do, you sons of Israel. So you love to do, you Baptists. So you love to do, you Pentecostals. So you love to do, you Charismatics. It's warning us. People love religion. It's much, much more convenient than Christianity. Come to church, sing the hymn, pay the tithe, deify the ism. Focus on that. That's what you focus on. That what you trust in, that's what you're going to become like. But we are not called to trust in any man. We are not called to trust in any church. We're not called to trust in any movement. We're not called to trust in any ism. We're not called to trust in any ministry, including Moriel, or any leader, including this one, if not especially this one. You laugh, ask my wife. We're not called to be conformed to the image and likeness of a church, a movement, or a denomination. We're not called to be conformed to the image and likeness of a Jacob Press. We're called to be conformed to the image and likeness of the risen Lord Jesus. Don't be like me. Don't be like my ministry. If your goal is to be like my ministry, you've missed the point of our ministry. Don't be like us. Be like him. God bless. <laughs>